Greetings and uh, welcome to today's message. Again, I thank you for inviting me into your homes or to wherever you are at present uh, listening to this uh, message or watching it. Thank you so much for your for your your prayers. Thank you much for your involvement, and um, we just uh, thank you very much here at Redwater Alliance Church for giving us this opportunity to be with you. Well, as we considered last week, we had spent uh, all our time really looking at Acts chapter 2 in the first 13 verses. And there Luke gives us a description of the beginnings of the new covenant community, the church at Jerusalem. A group of 120 or so Jewish followers of Jesus Christ had waited in prayer for the promised Holy Spirit. For Jesus had told his apostles, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So on this day, in the city of Jerusalem, circa first century, during the festival of harvest on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was sent by God and his son, Jesus Christ, as promised. Folks, when this event happened, it was not a page six news item located in some obscure newspaper in the backside of the Judean desert. No, when the Holy Spirit arrived at Pentecost, it made the front pages of the Jerusalem daily. It was number one in the Twitter feed because the Holy Spirit arrived in power. It was audible and it was visible. David Mathis, in his article, We Believe in the Holy Spirit, said this, quote, We believe in the Holy Spirit. That reality is more than meets the eyes that God is alive and at work in the world and in our lives, that an unseen person prompts, protects, and provides for those who are Christ's, that an almighty, invisible spirit powerfully brings the eternal purposes of God and his Son to bear in our realm, one day soon for all to see, end quote. The early church encountered heresies concerning the doctrine of the Trinity, and the person of Christ. They gathered and they produced a statement of Orthodox faith, and it's called the Nicene Creed. And in regard to the Holy Spirit, the statement reads this way, and we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. Friends, we encounter the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, from Genesis right through to Revelation. The person, the purpose, and role of the Holy Spirit is identified for us in each book of the Bible. His handprint is throughout Scripture, throughout Christian history to this day. And this begs the question that when you think about today, the 21st century church, why are there so many opinions, and that's what I'm calling them, concerning the Holy Spirit today? Often, as I've mentioned before, there's not that many issues with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ. Yet when it comes to the Holy Spirit, who is to be worshipped and glorified because the Holy Spirit is God, there are things attributed to the Holy Spirit The first, find no support in the Holy Bible, nor in the Orthodox practice of the Church throughout its history. We see this in the various kinds of movements in history. Seen, as I mentioned earlier, the heresies that were happening early in the Church and 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 the Church encountering them and dealing with them through the creeds. In particular, I think of the charismatic movements. For some in those movements have applied to the person and work of the Holy Spirit those things which are not found anywhere in the Bible, nor even here in the early church that we're examining today. And when the Bible is used as proof, these people use it as proof for the manifestation and power of the Holy Spirit, it is often managed, if you will, or massaged to support their false teaching regarding God the Holy Spirit. And I think the worst thing that happens with all this is that division has found its way to Christ's church. As some in these leadership positions in these these places have applied to themselves titles and roles that are no longer in effect in the church. And this has created an us and them uh, division. 
So you have these super spiritually gifted leader with direct, leaders with direct access to God who speaks to them on a regular basis, and then you have the rest. And the rest of the people are required to bow their minds and their hearts to this really uh, imposed authority, which is, not, which is not true, is not biblically based. They're to impose their, uh, themselves to this false authority uh, based on these uh, so-called super-duper apostles. My friends, the Bible teaches that God the Holy Spirit is the only one to be worshipped and given all glory and honor. And whenever miracles and prophecies and teaching is attributed to the Holy Spirit, which, Holy Spirit, which is unbiblical and outright false, the Holy Spirit is not worshipped. The Holy Spirit is made out to be a liar. And the Holy Spirit is grieved. And friends, because this is confusion in our day and over the course of Christian history, and there's much misunderstanding and misapplication, if I can say that, concerning the Holy Spirit, our time today will be spent unpacking the person role of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. So please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 10, and we'll be reading from verse 34 to 48. I'm using this as an example of the work of the Holy Spirit in the early church. Verse 34, Then Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on the cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom, witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him as he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one from God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of, them, of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Lord, bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful book of Acts that gives us, lays out for us, those early years of your church. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you sent the Holy Spirit to be our wisdom and to be our guide, to abide with us as a, not only a guarantor of our salvation, but also as the power that we would need to be the church and to be believers. Holy Spirit, then we ask that you would illuminate us, so bless us with that, help us understand, and we commit all this to you, O Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, folks, whenever we study a biblical text like this uh, book of Acts, which is a historical narrative, or otherwise, any text, we remember the fundamental rule of Bible interpretation. Context, context, context. So in keeping this in mind, we find by the time we, got, we get to our text, what we just read, events had transpired that had set up what happened with Cornelius and the Gentiles at his house. Because it was on this day, as chapter 10 describes, the church moved from a solely Jewish context to a Jewish-Gentile context. 
On the day of Pentecost, the Apostle Peter, in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaimed the gospel to God-fearing Jews in Jerusalem. And the Jerusalem church grew from 120 to 3,120 or so. The apostles were empowered by the Holy Spirit, and they healed the sick, they cast out demons, and they raised the dead. And the Jerusalem church would grow and grow. And as a church continued to grow, we see in Acts, it would bring to bear the gospel on many, but resistance would also grow. Resistance to the gospel. Resistance to their preaching. We know that Peter and John had been put in jail. We see that in, early in the Acts. They had been persecuted by the religious leadership of Jerusalem, and they were flogged. We go to chapter 6 and 7. The church continued to grow so much that the apostle appointed seven spirit-filled men to help in the day-to-day -day needs of the church. Chapter 6 describes the event concerning Stephen, one of the seven chosen on that day. Luke describes Stephen as a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And then in chapter 7, we find Stephen addressing the Sanhedrin, the ruling authority in Jerusalem, in essence, preaching the gospel of Christ. And what was the result of that? Well, we have the very first record of a martyr for Christ in the Bible, as Stephen was stoned for his witness. Chapter 8, we find that the citywide persecution came upon the church. Every believer, the book, uh, Acts tells us, except the apostles, were scattered, it says here, throughout Judea and Samaria. And this persecution was led by Saul, who we commonly know as Paul. For Saul was zealous to keep the honor and the law of God. Yet the gospel moved beyond the walls of Jerusalem because of this persecution. Well beyond Jerusalem, as later we see Philip the Evangelist in Samaria, revealing the gospel as he explained Isaiah 53 to the Ethiopian eunuch. And we know that the Ethiopian eunuch would go home, and we only know, we don't know how many people became to faith because of this. Chapter 9, we encounter the conversion of this persecutor called Saul, that we know as Paul, upon the Damascus Road. A supernatural encounter with Jesus himself. Jesus selecting Paul as his apostle, to the Gentiles. And this brings us to the very front end of chapter 10, which we did not read, but there we see the events orchestrated by the Holy Spirit, leading to Paul, Paul, uh, Peter's revelation in the courtyard of Cornelius' house, where Peter said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. My friends, through all this ordinary and, shall I say, extraordinary, extraordinary events of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit stands out clearly in these events. The book of Acts uh, reveals not only the acts of the apostles, but the work of the Holy Spirit in the church and in the believer's life. In other words, Acts highlights for us the Spirit's baptism, the Spirit's filling, and the Spirit's power. And let's take one of these at a time and examine them, starting with the Holy Spirit's baptism. Keeping in mind as we look at these three to set aside our presuppositions and our experiences concerning the Holy Spirit and let the text speak to us, let God's words speak to us and teach us. So we want to start with a definitive statement concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm using the help of wordsmith. And we can say it this way. The book of Acts confirms for us that the Holy Spirit is imparted to true believers of Jesus Christ at the time of their conversion. Let me read that again. The book of Acts confirms for us that the Holy Spirit is imparted to true believers of Jesus Christ at the time of their conversion. We go to Acts chapter 1. Luke there reminds his readers what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist, we go back to him in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Here, there he's speaking of Jesus, and, and, and John the Baptist said, He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. 
Pastor and theologian Bruce Milne, speaking about this important work of the Holy Spirit, said this, quote, Baptism in the Spirit is therefore one of the ways the New Testament speaks about becoming a Christian. Hence, every true believer in Christ has been baptized in the Spirit. Well, what does this all mean for you and me? Well, this is what it means. From the very day of Pentecost moving forward to our day, it, was, it is the norm for believers to receive the Holy Spirit at the time of their conversion. The Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost uh, specifically, specifically points out that the receiving of the Holy Spirit is a consequence of salvation. After he preached the gospel, the, the crowd of Jewish God-fearing people said, what, what can we do? And he said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And it comes with a promise, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when Peter and the apostles were brought before the ruling council in Jerusalem, they were ordered to cease and desist their teaching of the gospel of Christ. Of course, they refused. And Peter said to them, we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Please notice the language of repentance. The language of repentance and the language of obedience to God. And it speaks of salvation and conversion. And thus the imparting or baptism of the Holy Spirit upon that conversion. Our text today in chapter 10 reveals the conversion of the first Gentiles in Acts. Resulting in the baptism of the Holy Spirit which was made manifest as they spoke in foreign languages. Later on in the next chapter, Peter reflects with the other apostles of this, on this particular event at Cornelius' house, and he equates that event with the Gentile believers' baptism of the Holy Spirit with, that, with what had occurred, pardon me, to the Jewish believers at Pentecost. You can check that out for yourself in Acts chapter 11 and Acts chapter 15. So you might be asking now, Pastor, how about those places in Acts where there are apparent variation to this norm? Well, of course, time is not on our side to be detailed. And we keep applying then the context, context, context is a rule of thumb. And say this, the few places that differ to the normal pattern concerning Holy Spirit baptism serve to highlight really and uh, highlight and reinforce the norm. They are not the norm. And Luke does this purposefully. He doesn't avoid these events. And he includes them. And I think he includes them to make this point. God reserves the right to include the extraordinary for his own purposes and plans. Does God still do the extraordinary? Does the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, still do the extraordinary today? Of course. Then we have to ask, how are we to understand these extraordinary events? Well, I appeal to Mill again, the theologian Mill. He's very helpful for us here. And he provides this good rule of thumb for us concerning what one might call extraordinary experiences of the Holy Spirit. Quote, experiences and ministries of the Spirit are never for the selfish indulgence of the individual. They are for the good and growth of the church and ultimately for the glory of Christ through his people. What what Mill, Mill means is this. If someone is experiencing the Holy Spirit and they're doing it for their own selfish gain, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's for the good and the growth of the church whenever the Holy Spirit shows up in these extraordinary experiences. And ultimately, like I mentioned last week, it's for the glory of Christ. The Holy Spirit is always focusing all his attention on Christ. And we do that through the worship of Christ. So having said this, the norm has been established from the very beginning here from Pentecost True believers are baptized in the Holy Spirit at conversion. We go back to the Apostle Paul, who has established for you and me today the biblical base, the foundation, if you will, for our next piece, the filling of the Holy Spirit. You go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, 
where we read, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And for those of you who say, well, that's contextualized for only Ephesians, I would disagree with you. This is a principle that we have already seen here in Acts, the filling of the Holy Spirit. We see this not only in Acts, we see this in the epistles as well. We see this in the Gospels as well. We see this in the Old Testament, by the way. But the book of Acts reveals that the will of the Holy Spirit is worked out by filling his people, the believers, with his very presence and power, making it stand out, if you will. Milne puts it this way, quote, Christians are called upon to be filled with the Spirit. Milne also talks about the word fill, and it is a metaphor. And then if we force this metaphor too far, too hard, too literally, it will mislead us. And what happens when we force the filling of the Holy Spirit so hard and make it so literal, it molds the glorious Holy Spirit into some weird spiritual substance. And it makes you and I simply just a uh, container of that substance. My friends, there are plenty of passages in the book of Acts where believers are filled with the Spirit. For example, chapter 4, the believers in Jerusalem responding to Peter and John's report prayed, and after they prayed, we, we talked about this last week, the place was, where, they were was, was, where they were meeting was shaken. And that tells us in Acts 4.31, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and the result of this was they spoke the word of God boldly. Chapter 6 begins with the believers in Jerusalem choosing deacons to help with the growing church. As I mentioned already, one was Stephen, and the text tells us that he was a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Also in the book of Acts, the filling of the Holy Spirit is linked to joy. And not just joy in every day, but joy in hard, difficult circumstances. We see this in chapter 13. The word of the Lord was spreading throughout the region of Sidian Antioch. And there some incited a riot against the gospel bearers, if you will, which resulted in the persecution of the Apostle Paul and his companion Barnabas. They were literally chased out of the region from this persecution. And Luke tells us, so they took, shook the dust from their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Yes, the, joy, the Holy Spirit brings us joy even in the midst of the most difficult, difficult times of our lives and in the life of the church as well. Well, friends, we could go to other places in the Acts and find the same thing. Believers being filled with the Holy Spirit. So I think we need to pause here. And I want to make some comments. When it comes to statements such as baptized in the Holy Spirit and filled with the Holy Spirit, we don't have to go too far today to find misunderstanding and a misapplication of these terms. And one question that commonly is asked concerning the filling of the Holy Spirit goes, some, goes like this. Is this filling of the Holy Spirit an essential once-for-all experience? Today, in charismatic circles, even in evangelical circles, maybe other circles, the answer for some would be yes. We found this, as I said, in the charismatic circles, in some charismatic circles, and uh, as I said, found in evangelical churches as well. So how do we navigate through this? Well, let's keep it simple, sweetie. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, which is our biblical basis or foundation, sort of our command, if you will, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we see the verb to, uh, to be filled, be filled, in the original is a continuous tense. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'll put it plainly. To paraphrase this verse, we can say it this way, go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Go on being filled with the Holy Spirit today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day. You see, the early church experienced the continued filling of the Holy Spirit. 
And we should not confuse this with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Spirit, which is a once-for-all experience, if you can say it that way. And so to close off this piece, I appeal to theologian Milne again, quote, to be filled with the Spirit implies that the Spirit is the dominant influence in our behavior. And this is where it gets confusing with us. But it's simply here in this statement saying, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the presence and power of the Holy Spirit is evident in your life. And I point you to Galatians 5, 22, or 5, 20, 21, 22, the fruit of the Spirit. And because of this ambiguity and misunderstanding sometimes, uh, next week, uh, please join me as we will spend our time discovering what it is to walk in step with the Holy Spirit, what it's like to live a life in the Holy Spirit. Well, last but not the very least, the very important piece The book of Acts reveals the Holy Spirit leading and empowering the church for service and for growth. And and friends, this is so important for us to understand. How we understand the power of the Holy Spirit is critical for the local assembly of God's people. It's critical for our witness of Christ in our local communities. It's critical for the mission of the church in the world to bring the gospel to all places of the world. Luke, in his book, emphasizes that the Holy Spirit is the source of spiritual power. And he does this by pointing to Jesus. And we should always look to Jesus for all these things we wonder about in our theology. He points to Jesus and his success in ministry as a direct work of the Holy Spirit in and through Jesus. He began the book of Acts this way by explaining it until the day he was taken up, that is Jesus, after giving instructions to the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. The Holy Spirit working in and through Jesus to give instruction to the apostles. And I think as a church, not I think, I know as a church, <coughs> we need to understand this. That the power of the Holy Spirit may manifest in the ministry of Jesus is a model of ministry for the church today. For you and me in ministry. Any successes the ministry of Redwater Alliance has had for the kingdom of God over the years is solely due to the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Our example for ministry is found right here in the book of Acts. We see the Holy Spirit leading the early believers to witness powerfully and boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ. Check out chapter 4, verse 8 and following. Chapter 5, verse 30 30 and 32. We see this in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. For example, when the Holy Spirit moved Paul to witness to the Corinthian Jews concerning the identity of Jesus. Chapter 18. The book of Acts reminds us that the Holy Spirit was over every activity of the church's growth in the first century. Acts addresses the Holy Spirit as the power in the growth of the church, chapter 9, verse 31. We see that the Holy Spirit transported the evangelists to witness to the Ethiopian eunuch, as mentioned earlier in chapter 8, 29 and following. On and on and on, we can go through all the book of Acts, through the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit empowering men and women to fulfill the mission of the church and for service. My friends, the early church leaned hard into the Holy Spirit for direction and for power. And the Holy Spirit, my friends, leads and empowers the church for growth and service today. As a church, our successes for the kingdom of God is directly related to our relationship with the Holy Spirit. And this begs the question, how are we doing, church? Have we submitted ourselves as a corporate body of Christ to the leading and supervision of the Holy Spirit in the local assembly? Is God the Holy Spirit given the worship and honor he is due? Or is is the Holy Spirit treated like some ethereal spiritual entity that does our bidding? Some cosmic spiritual power that we seek to just satisfy our own selfish desires and dreams. 
Well, friends, in summation, one, true believers are baptized in the Holy Spirit at conversion. Two, Christians are called upon to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Three, the Holy Spirit leads and empowers the church for growth and service. Well, this brings us to the end of uh, the message for today. And I would like to close with a, a prayer, a, a prayer that I'm going to read, a Celtic prayer by Calvin Miller. Miller. Let us pray. Father, all-powerful and ever-living God, we do all, well always and everywhere to give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. You, O Father, with your only begotten Son and Holy Spirit, are God. God, one and immortal, God incorruptible and unmoving, God invisible and faithful, God wonderful and worthy of praise, God strong and worthy of honor, God most high and magnificent, God living and true. We believe in you, we bless you, we adore you, and we praise your name forevermore. We praise you through Christ, who is the salvation of the universe, through Christ, who is the life of human beings, through Christ, who is the resurrection of the dead. Through him, the angels praise your majesty, the dominations adore, the powers of the heaven of heavens tremble, the virtues and the blessed seraphim celebrate in exaltation. So grant, we pray you, that our voices may be admitted to the chorus in humble declaration of your glory. This we pray in the beloved name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for, thank you for being well, with me, but thank you for inviting me into your home. God bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name, amen.